Welcome back to another episode of Gym Girl Chats. Today, I have a very special guest. Well, they all have been special guests, but this one I'm very excited. We have Savannah Peters joining us today, and we will just be chatting about Gym Girl stuff. So diving into things, Savannah, I have a very important question for you. What is the order that you get ready in when it comes to like your hair, makeup, or getting your clothes on? Oh, specifically if it's right before the gym or like during the day, like when you're getting ready for the day? Just like even if it's like whether you're going out for a date night, you're going to the gym, whatever it may be, like what is the order? And you can even say if you have a different order based on what you're doing. So I... If it's getting ready for like anything, like typically like my hair and my face is already set. Like I need like minimal touch up. I used to work in cosmetics. So I try to make sure that like my face lasts throughout the day and I don't really sweat too much. So I don't have to worry about like massive touch up touch ups or anything like that. But um, I would certainly say it's usually going to be my outfit because I feel like I am kind of like lacking in just kind of clothing wear right now in general. Mm -hmm. So it's always a challenge to be like, okay, what kind of occasion is this? And what am I going to wear? But usually everything set, it's mainly just the outfit and how I'm going to coordinate that. Do you do makeup before hair or hair before makeup then? Uh, I do makeup before hair. I wake up, I get my face on because it just helps me. I put my face on. <laughs> it just helps me feel prepared for the day. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do my hair and I've been trying to take it like tailor it down on um, styling my hair because I fried it about a year and a half ago. I tried to go like 90% blonde. Okay. You and I That was are a little bit same. of a mistake. <laughs> yep. And so my face, my hair just like fried there for a minute. So I've been like sleeping in silk caps, like trying to make sure I don't style it every day so that I don't have to do much to my hair. Plus it just cuts down on time on getting ready. Yes. I, I went super blonde. I want to say like a few months ago, like two or three months ago. And even like my hairstylist was saying, like when she was applying the color, like there was having problems with it fully lifting, but she was like, maybe it's just like what it's doing with your hair. But like, I noticed how much hair that I like lost. And I was so upset oh, with yeah. myself because I was just like, it wasn't worth it like at all. But I just wasn't even thinking. I was just like, I want it blonder. And then we've been like slowly going more towards like my actual color because I've been I've never really dyed my roots, or at least it's been like years and years since I've dyed my roots. And so I've always kept it where it can at least like blend a little bit more. But I'm honestly trying to go more towards like a brown slash a bronze just to be able to like pull it down and make it easier because like hair appointments do take a long time. And then it's also of like anything that I can do to make things a little bit more low maintenance because I know I'm always gonna like have my tan on basically. And so it's like I got to pick between what matters the most. And it's like if I can get away with some things with hair that can make it last longer and like with the style and with the color, then I'm going to freaking do it. Oh, yeah. And I think we we essentially kind of have like very similar hairstyles at the moment, like the way that our color is placed. Because like it, I, I didn't realize or maybe I did. I Again, I used to work in cosmetics and used to be around cosmetologists all the time. So like just realizing that I thought I was going to be able to maintain 90% blonde there mm -hmm. for a minute. It washed me out, by the way. Like, yeah. Yeah, I didn't have any, like, facial definition. I looked at myself in photos and was like, oh, my God, you just look, like, completely washed out. <laughs> like, there's no definition whatsoever. I honestly, I've been searching to figure out, like, what is the hair color that is the best for me? Because I went for a while. I was like, do I go more I like what you have right now. Like I feel like that fits you really well. Well, thank you. I, I do feel like this is something that I've liked more than I've liked some of the other things, but it's hard because I'll ask Alex and I'll be like, which do you like better? And he's like, hasn't it just always been blonde? And I'm like... <laughs> You're like, no, it's changed. It's babe. been like, like all different types of blonde. It's been in different places. It's been balayage. It's been more full color. Like it's been all over the place. So like get with it. It looks different. Um, but <laughs> I, I am liking where it is now. And I'm also really liking the length because I just cut like a few inches off of it. And so I like where it's at now where I'm not having to like deal with as much hair. Um, and then it just gives me room because I've liked it shorter than it is now too. So just mm -hmm. lets me play with it a little bit. Which speaking of hair and and making the style last longer, I did just discover the new holy grail of dry shampoos. So 
I do need to share what it is. It's K18, the brand, just came out with one called the Air Wash. And I already use that brand because when I did fry off my hair for a little bit there, I was like, I need to repair it. And I was using their K18 like leave-in conditioner situation. And that helped a ton. And I've heard other people really enjoy that as well. And so then I saw the ad for their new dry shampoo. And I was like, oh my gosh, I need to get it. Put it in the cart and was like waiting because I was like, do I really need it? What What's my deal here? Then like the next day, the cap broke off of the dry shampoo I was using where it was like a full bottle, but now it's like broken. And I was like, sweet, awesome. Love that for me. And then like that weekend, we had a team meeting and one girl on the team, Rachel, she was like, Sue, I have to tell you about this new product that you need in your life. And I was like, tell me more. And she was like the K18 dry shampoo. And I was like, it was already in my cart. This is fate. I'm going to order it now. And it is unlike any other dry shampoo because most of them are like the aerosol containers or like the propellants. And this one is more like a spray bottle. Like it's like feels like it's water kind of coming out of it. Like it's a very fine mist. Do you squeeze the bottle so that it propels air out? No, it's still like a a a pump. pump. Yeah. But it even on the side of the bottle, it says, and it says shake well, and you can hear there's like a ball in there that you're shaking. Mm. It's a plastic bottle, but you can hear like the ball in there. And even on the bottle, it's like, it may feel like your hair is wet, but just give it a second. It won't mess up your style. It's not making it wet. And then like rub it in because today my hair was a greasy mess. Like last time I washed it was over a week ago. And I was like, that's fine. I'll just wear a bandana today and no one will be able to tell. But the bandana ended up not looking good with the sweatshirt, but I was already committed to the sweatshirt shirt. So I was like, I got to figure out something with my hair. And I look and I'm like, oh my gosh, my dry shampoo just came in. I was like, well, Rachel said it saved her from hair that she never thought could be saved as far as like it being far too greasy to like wear out. And I was like, okay, let me give this a shot. And even Alex walked in right before I filmed and he was like, your hair looks really good. Did you shower? And I was like, Bitch, no. <laughs> I use dry shampoo. K-18. So um, would highly recommend. And if they want to sponsor me and send me more bottles, because it honestly was kind of expensive, but worth it, Yeah, then I will take that. They are a little pricey, but obviously I've heard nothing but great things about them. I did not purchase it because I was a little, I was being, trying to be a little more frugal on my spending habits uh, when I was with my hair. Uh, and when it was a little more fried, but there's this also really great one that I got and it's probably lasted me like six months. So I got two of them at the time. It was when uh, Black Friday was around on Amazon and it's by this French brand. And I actually was educated by one of the women that used to work for that brand when I used to work in cosmetics because they want you to know about the products and be able to sell them, of course. Um, And it's by this brand called Chlorine and it's French. Mm -hmm. And so it's like the only one that's like, you know, what is it like regulated by the European, you know, uh, governing bodies for like, you know, beauty products and stuff and say that it's actually like really, really good for you. So this one, you can squeeze the bottle and it does feel still kind of like flowery, kind of like, you know, dry shampoo-y, but it's, um, it's really nice because it doesn't leave like my hair heavier. Mm -hmm. And it still gives a little bit of texture too. But it's really interesting that KAT1 is like makes your, it feels like it makes your hair a little damp, which it seems like it has some kind of like conditioning quality to it. And then helps to kind of like restore a little bit of freshness. That's really interesting about that one. It like truly feels like it's getting washed. Like I feel like with dry shampoo, I'm kind of just like blunting the grease basically of like I'm trying to dry it up. And some of them still work good. Like I'm not hating on normal dry shampoos. I've used them for years. But like the fact that this looks like, I mean, if you're just listening to the podcast, you have no idea what's going on. Yeah. I would believe you showered. Yeah. Like, I couldn't believe. (laughs) I was like, I wish I took a before picture, but I didn't think it was going to be this drastic (laughs) because my hair looked so gross like an hour ago. And I was like, wow, this is awesome for me. Dude, next time. You'll always have next time. We will always have dirty hair days. Yeah, that is very true. I will always have dirty hair, um, which is why I love when I get compliments on my hair. And I'm like, you don't even know how long it's been since I've washed it, but thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much. (laughs) But with you talking about being in cosmetics, I actually was personally interested of like what you used to do in cosmetics because you always are, you have full beat slay to your makeup. And I'm always like, man, I wish I could do that. So you already look like you do that. What are you talking Uh, about? I I watch a lot of make, that's like one of my guilty pleasures is like watching makeup videos like on YouTube. Like I really love makeup videos and I just got into makeup 
up in like the past two years. And it's basically, you know, how some people say like uh, it's not a good gift to like get a gift card. I feel the opposite. I'm like, get me an Ulta or Sephora gift card and I will always be happy. That's actually like one of the best gifts you can get me because you don't know what I want and I have a full basket of things that I want. So like just hook me up and I'll be good to go. And what if I tell you what I want, but you get the wrong thing and then I have to go back and return it and then I have to worry about making sure that it's in stock. Yes. And they all have names where it's like maybe a brand has even like with lip liners, like NYX has like five different types of lip liners, but it's like I know visually what lip liner it is, but I couldn't tell the name of it, but I know which one I want. Yeah, I used to I used to work in cosmetics before I got into the fitness industry. I would say that's probably kind of like my first love. Um, I mean, fitness has always been a part of my life, but I never um, like educated myself on it until I decided to like go into the fitness space. But cosmetics and skincare primarily, like I uh, went to school to be an esthetician because my mom wasn't going to let me move to Arizona unless I got an education. And um, meteorology at the University of Kansas flew right over my head. (laughs) I cheated my way through physics in high school and stuff. And like, I don't know how I was in so many AP classes. Um, But just in general, like I knew that I like skincare. I knew that I was interested in it. I knew it was a field that was going to be just like continuing to evolve with how much was going on at that moment. This is like, you know, 2013, 14, 15 in part of 16. Um, And when I was working in skincare, I was an esthetician. I always found myself like going into cosmetics. Like I was just always more interested in like selling and educated on cosmetics. And it was just so much more fun. Like skincare, I feel like when you're at a more advanced level and you get into peels and lasers and, you know, um, injections and things like that, which I mean, I think primarily nurses do that now, which is completely fine. But just as a whole, like I found myself gravitating towards there. And so eventually I worked for Lancome there for a hot minute and uh, worked at one of their counters. And then when Scott scooped me up to Austin, that's when Mac, and I don't know if you remember this, but it was like a big deal oh, for yeah. um, for Ulta employees is when Mac was just getting into Ulta so that you didn't have to go to the mall or you didn't have to order Mac online or you didn't have to go to like a Mac store that's like so far from home. I was so excited and I'm like, well, I'm moving to Austin, Texas. There's this Mac countertop that's coming here. I have luxury experience with Lancome. I was like, I'm going to apply for this position. And I got it. And I was the, um, Mac counter manager there. Yeah, that's big stuff. Like Mac has always been like such a big brand. And like anyone I've talked to in makeup is always like, I remember when I used to like save up money and like go to the Mac counter and do X. I'm like, yeah, that was like one of the like top brands for everyone of like looking up of being like, if I could work for Mac, because that also used to be a huge thing for, again, just being able to work at the counter or be employed by Mac. And they did so much education for everyone who worked for them. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And e- e- even if like, you know, any of these people that are listening, if you're from like the Midwest and you're from like a smaller town, like I grew up in Southwestern Kansas. So like perspective wise, like I didn't even know or see a Louis Vuitton bag until I was probably like 22. And I was like, oh my God, it's a Louis Vuitton bag. Like, oh my God, that girl has everything. Or like, look, it's a Mac countertop because the next Mac countertop that I could go to in Southwestern Kansas I would have to go to Denver or I would probably have to go to Kansas City at that time. Like that's how far away it was for me and like how foreign it was. And so it was even a more of an elevated experience for me. Like I'm going to work for a Mac. Like this is so cool. So just being in cosmetics, I um, uh, was with the Mac counter for a while. And truth be told, I wish I stayed there because it's just – it's not as tiring or challenging to manage that countertop with the employees that I had under it. And that was still very fun. You had a lot of education and stuff like that. And then I went into management with Ulta and I was their prestige manager. So not only was I over the countertops, but I was a manager over like the fancy side of the store, basically, um, which is called prestige. And that just kind of sucked all the fun out of it. There were fun things, but like you didn't get to sell as much, which I just loved selling. I love just like talking to people and helping people. And uh, I think that's one thing why I really enjoy coaching is because it's like helping people and like solve problem solving, because that's actually what you had to do a lot of the times when you're in, you know, any kind of sales position is that you have to know the product to know which one to like recommend them to. And it's kind of very similar, like when you're working with clients of like asking the right questions, knowing what to do, um, being able to kind of have like the 
the right things in place to be able to support them. Because you can't just sell them something that you don't know about. You obviously need to know your stuff and be able to just take the right guidance rather than going from first gear to third gear already. You need to just take those steps at a time. So that was a really fun thing that I think has helped me be a better coach is like I had to help people through those problems and ask the right questions. Yeah. I Well, I love that so much. And I bet that would be just so fun to be surrounded by so much makeup and being able to try it, learn about it. Uh, so what are your like top makeup products? Like if you had to say like your top three products mm. and or brands that you are using, like, or even just like right now, it doesn't have to be all time of just like, what are products that you're loving right now? So one that has been a tried and true for me for probably the past three, maybe four years, three years, is the L'Oreal True Match Hyaluronic Acid Serum Foundation, the one mm -hmm. that comes in a dropper. Which I hate the dropper, but the, the actual product is very good. <laughs> yeah, that one I really, really enjoy. Um, and then I would have to say one that I've done really well with my brows, but I'm thinking about going towards another one that's soon going to be an Ulta or like, you know, physical location that I can go pick up rather than ordering it. The one that I use right now is the NYX uh, brow like lift in. It's not the lift and snatch. It's the brow mascara. It's the one with the pink top. Okay. It's and like the guy, glue and it's like yeah, in the, it, okay. Yes. It gives me like this laminated look mm -hmm. and it makes my brows stay on really well, but it also gives color to it. Probably use that one for about two and a half years. So that's a tried and true. And then... I'm just going to go with a lip product that I'm wearing right now is probably the Milani traditional, um, you know, sharpened pencil lip liner. I love this color so much and it's such an affordable like lip liner. I think it's ridiculous. Like even though obviously I can go buy luxury things, there's so many things that I found that are just so easily accessible in like the drugstore aisle that I'm just like, why would I spend this extra money when I can literally find the same thing? Honestly, the drugstore has some incredible pieces. Like I love the NYX um, serum concealer that they have. That is like one of my oh, with top. with the little tiny, tiny pink top? Yes. And you have to like squirt pump. it instead of like having like the yes. doe foot. That one is so good and lasts so long. But like I always make sure I have backups of that. And it's such a good product also. Like if anyone ever asks me about makeup products, I always recommend drugstore first. Not only because of the price point, but also... Also, because if you're trying things out to see if you like them or not, it's so much better to go and buy something that's like eight, ten dollars max. Like I think honestly, the most expensive makeup product nowadays at the drugstore is like around fifteen dollars. Like some of the foundations do go up to that, but a lot of the time it's like eight and under for what you're getting. Now, of course, if you're getting a full face of makeup, then that's going to be altogether like fifty something plus dollars. But so much better than sometimes that's just just the foundation for the higher end products. So I love NYX for the concealer. I love the NYX pencils. I think it's the slim lip pencil pencils um, for lip liners. And lip liner is something that I used to be like, not against, I just didn't know what I was missing. Like I never used lip liner because I was kind of scared of it. And then I like started using it a year or two ago. And now I'm like, I that's the thing like I need to have in my purse, like I need to have on me and I just love a good lip liner. Um, Interesting. Yeah. I not it, that not that you were against it, but I've always felt like I wanted to use lip liner because I've never had like super prominent lips. I've probably had my lips filled two or three times just to get some like natural volume. But before I did, my top lip didn't have like enough fullness to it. So like immediately it was just kind of one of those things that I was just like, oh, like I kind of need to like overline my top lip to like get something out of it. I just like literally knew nothing about makeup. That was the thing. And so I was scared of it and I didn't know how to use it. And then you see people use it the wrong way and you're like, I don't want to look like that. And so it was even something that I did my sister's makeup for like an event that she had. And it was funny because I had her kind of facing away from the mirror and she was like, I feel like you're making it really heavy and I don't want it to be heavy. And I was like, listen, the key to having it stay on your face and look natural is layers but thin layers, yeah. but layers. And then I pull out the lip pencil and she's like, no, I, or the lip liner. And she's like, no, I don't want that. And I was like, 
The thing is, you can wipe it off. If you don't want it, wipe it off. But I promise you, you are going to want this. And I like did it on her lip and use something very close to her lip color, but just give her a little bit definition, a little bit of size. And she was like, I've never gotten so many compliments on my face. And she was like, and I need a lip liner stat. And I was like, yeah, it's the best thing ever and incredible. And you should always have one on you. Oh, yeah. It's it's just an experiment with people try new things on their face. It's like the first time that somebody wears like false eyelashes, whether you get them done by like somebody that you're like laying down and doing the individuals, which I've never been able to do, <laughs> or like putting on strip lashes, you're going to be like, this feels so weird. And it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, like you've never done it before. So it's going to feel off. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. For you. you should lift heavy. High reps. Carbs low are needed. Keto squats are bad for your Squats are great. You for should squat ass to grass. Toes. It's fine. It fits my macros. For idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one-on-one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I I could talk about makeup and kind of go into this, honestly, uh, for the whole episode. But um, in case anyone's not super interested in makeup, then we will uh, go ahead and move on. But I did want to ask about your newest running ventures and how that's going. Yeah. Oh, man. I think if anything, so I used to run and track in high school. I was just a very small, frail girl that didn't know how to fuel her body for all the activity that she was doing. And so... um, and plus, I'm a triplet, so I've always just I've I've been born small, and uh, I saw Scott was starting to get into running again. It's always been something like in the back of my mind. Of course, like you know, like some type of hybrid training is getting like really popular nowadays. But I just needed to do something that didn't make me feel like I was in this box of bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. Because even though I've personally never wanted to bodybuild and that's never something that I've wanted to do, like compete and stuff like that, that's the people that I've been surrounded by, like thankfully. Mm -hmm. And it's taught me so much. I've been able to see, you know, some of the top competitors in out there and really get to meet a lot of cool people. But it always kind of felt like if I was to go outside of bodybuilding and outside of trying to like build on top of my physique because it's just hard for me to just put on tissue. And, you know, right now I'm working on kind of like improving my thyroid levels and my testosterone levels and my progesterone to estrogen ratio that it almost just kind of stressed me out if I just even thought about doing something different than bodybuilding and like putting on muscle tissue and training really hard and stuff like that. So I just decided, I was like, you know what? There's absolutely nothing that's holding me back right now from just trying to enjoy exercise a little bit more. Because no matter who you follow or who is the most athletic person that you that you know, there's going to be a time period where they're just like, I feel like I'm doing the same thing. What I'm doing is kind of stressing me out. Or it's just not giving me the same amount of enjoyment as it used to. And I feel like that's only normal because you do the same things over and over again. It's going to have not necessarily more negative impact, but it's just going to feel the same. You're not going to get that same lift like you did before. Um, and I really missed being outside and like this, this spring I've been like camping with friends a couple of weekends and I just really miss like being outside. So like what better idea than to like go on a light run. And now I actually have Billy's right here, just sleeping next to me. I was like, you know what? Like, I just want my little guy to come running with me too, because Scott is a hell of a lot faster than (laughs) I am right now. So I don't want to like mess up him, you know, improving his, um, cardiovascular system and aerobic aerobic capacity. Cause he's just like, come on, babe, like, let's hurry up. (laughs) <laughs> in the first run that I went on, like I went way too fast out of the gate. Mm-hmm. It was like an 830 pace for somebody that's <laughs> never ran in like 10 years. And I was like, yeah, I still got it. Because <laughs> we all get ahead of ourselves when we do something different that we knew we can push ourselves with. And I was rendered useless for like the entire week. It probably took me a week and a half to like train again or run again. Um, but I really just wanted something that would be able to make me not feel like I was just in this bodybuilding box. I wanted to... Um, experiment and experience fitness just a little bit more and running is that way for me because I'm way more excited about training now. Like I'm putting in more strength perspectives and still dabble in a little bit of hypertrophy, but running outside just, you know, 
being outside is just the best. And so like, I want to do that with running. Being outside is truly the best. And especially as another weather gets nicer. I mean, I guess where you are, it's nice most of the year, but um, here in the Midwest and Ohio, then it is not. So definitely as it gets nicer, it's like, I just want to be outside. And I talked about this on the episode for that we did with Bailey, because Bailey's getting into running and she actually just ran a half marathon like on her own the other day because she oh. just got into running and always thought that she would hate running. And we talked about how hybrid training is getting so popular. And some people kind of roll their eyes at it of like, oh, someone else doing hybrid training. It's all the rave now. But it's like the reason it's all the rave now is because most people have been following someone who's been doing bodybuilding or gym or strength-based training. And that person has been doing it for five, 10, 10 years. years. Yeah. <laughs> and they're at a place where it's like, I want to add in different types of fitness. And I think that's the beauty of how you phrased it of like, I just wanted to do different types of fitness. And that's also something where like, you can't always fit in a training session, but you might be able to fit in a run or just recovery wise of like, okay, I can't do a full training session and have the juice for that, but I can do a light run and be able to enjoy that. And so it's just being able to figure out what allows you to be the most well-rounded, especially as your life changes, like your life has changed a lot in 10 years of what is required of you, what your capacity is, um, what your time is, all of that. And so just being able to figure out how can I still prioritize my health and fitness and still reach the levels I want to professionally or in my personal life, whatever that may be, then it just gives you more flexibility with that. And I'm very pro that. Even though I'm not personally a runner, I'm very pro it for anyone who wants to figure out how fitness works into their life. I'm a walker. Like, I love to walk. Um, and Alex <laughs> still finds that. He's like, I don't get the same thing from walking. And I was like, I just love a good walk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, walks with dogs is is Sue's theme. Is mm -hmm. I like to walks with dogs. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's just sorry the best. you cut out there a little bit for me, so I missed what you were saying for a hot minute. Uh, it's all good. I just talked about how it's any way that you can fit it into your life to be able to make it more enjoyable. Um, and even if I'm not someone who's very uh, much a runner, like any way that you can fit it in. Of like, I've seen a lot of people within training now go into okay, now I do Pilates a few days a week, or now I do yoga, whatever it may be. It's like any way that you can improve your physical fitness and or mental fitness. And it's like running is going to improve your cardiovascular health where lifting isn't necessarily going to do that. Yoga is going to help with your flexibility. Pilates is going to help with your core strength. Like there's all these different benefits and why not pull from those benefits? Yeah. And I think like, again, it's, it's, I'm sure it's a point that you've said before too, is just like the, the mental aspect of it again, was just so big for me of not feeling like I can't, that I can only do some kind of bodybuilding training because if I go anywhere outside of that, you know, personally for me, I'm going to lose weight or I'm going to lose muscle for all this weight and muscle tissue that I've been working so hard to like accrue. Well, no, not really. If you really have the right approach and you're taking in enough food and you have the right mental approach to it, you know, like I haven't stepped on the scale for a hot minute because I, I think I've just been starting to realize this, that you know, we, we hear a lot of the rhetoric and, you know, I, I know I'm, my body type is not the, the general body type of a lot of women, right. Where they like hold on to a lot of weight and they gain a lot of weight. I, I'm, I'm kind of the opposite. So with that said, like, I realized that I've kind of had a very similar, not to like an extreme sense, but just like, if I had a low weigh in one morning, I'm like, well, shit, everything that I've worked towards has just for nothing, mm -hmm. you know, like I, I would, I would feel low if I had a low weigh-in because I'm just trying to weigh higher as a whole. But of course, like things are really like measured upon average. And that's one thing that I've been trying to tell my clients lately is like, you have to look at it in the grand scheme of things. Like consistency is also going to go with averaging things out. And if you look at things on average, and if you're trending in that right direction, then you have nothing to worry about. It, it's ridiculous to let you you think that one way in, whether it's a low way in like me or a high way in for somebody else, to just completely think that everything that you're doing is not worth it or not working. So I actually just, I've recently had that realization of like, I would just be on the scale. It wouldn't totally ruin my day, but it would kind of like stay in my mind of like, oh, you have a lower weigh in. You probably need to eat more, even though you're already just really exhausted with how much food that you're eating or anything like that. But as of lately, I've just pulled back a little bit of food. 
I'm still technically in a surplus, but I still wanted to ensure that like when I'm taking in enough protein and I know that I can take in enough carbohydrates, it's just the previous split that I was on. I was just, it was exceedingly higher than what's more comfortable for a long period of time. And it's always good just to pull back a little bit. I don't feel, you know, it's kind of like just, um, slow or heavy. And it's probably benefited me a little bit now that I'm running to not eat as much carbohydrates because I don't feel as heavy, but I'm still eating enough to be able to like replenish, you know, my body and refuel it too. Yeah. I think that it's something just anyone who has gone through periods of trying to gain muscle and does have to eat a lot, regardless of if they're a hard gainer or just like in general, I I, I don't want to classify myself necessarily as a hard gainer. And that's probably because I just don't want to put it in my head that that's the way that it is. But it, d- it is difficult for me to gain muscle and I do have to push for it. But when you eat a lot of food for a long period of time, it is exhausting and boring. And some people might be listening and be like, I've never been at that place in my life. I've always wanted more. More food. Um, but I will say that it can get just monotonous. You can start to like not have any appetite, not any food yeah. looks like horrible. And so that is when it's good to kind of just pull back, give yourself a little bit of a break so then you can keep pushing forward. It's not like taking it. I mean, it necessarily could be looked at as taking a step forward to take like 12 st- or step backwards, to take like 12 steps forward. But it's really just like allowing yourself some space to like get back into it. Um, so I think that that's always beneficial, especially if you've been in a period of like pushing food for a long time. I always go through times of like pulling back for a little bit just for my own sanity. Yeah. Um, that actually made me think about something like my family growing up, we were never like super food focused person people, even though my mom is actually quite the opposite. I didn't realize it until about a few, uh, probably like 2018, 2019, but she has hypothyroidism and I was on the cusp of that. So that's what I'm working on to not get on medication. Um, but just as a whole, like it never impacted me enough as a little girl because my mom never put her own personal struggles on me with her weight and stuff. Um, plus she was always working. She, for a majority of like my childhood, she was a single mom. And so like, you know, she's just stressed out, working her ass off and, you know, providing for triplets and an older child. So like four kids. So, um, just as a whole, like, I know that she always wanted to like lose weight or like look better and stuff. And so it's really interesting. And that never like impacted me and made me look at myself because I always felt like my, I knew that my body was always different from my mom's. And like I said, she never pushed her insecurities onto me, which I think was, you know, just coming from a very grateful position. Like she never put that on her because I know I've had so many clients with their moms kind of put their mom's insecurities, put it on them unintentionally, not maliciously or anything like that. But that brings me to the question because my family wasn't super food focused. Food was always around. I was always super active. Like I knew for me, like I, even as like, you know, a 15 year old, I was like, well, I just need to eat because I have cross country track, track practice. I'm like just doing stuff with my friends all the time that like with your family situation where was your family like a super food focused family? Like, oh my God, it's just this big, like emotional experience and there's so much love with food and not to say that my mom wasn't the best cook but I didn't have like phenomenal cooks as a kid like probably the best cook that I had and I miss him so much it's my he, my uncle he was run, once removed him and my aunt are no longer together but he was a hunter and he just made the best food that you can think <laughs> of so that's probably like the the experiences that I remember as a kid where emotions is in food, but just on a day-to-day basis, it was almost more so just like, I'm active as a young woman. I need to, I need to eat just in general. Granted, I wish I consumed more protein, but (laughs) mainly in the form of carbohydrates. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your family situation? Was it very food focused, emotional? Yeah. So my mom is a very great cook. And that's something where she like, she literally will make like a new dessert every week based on whoever wants the dessert and makes incredible chocolate chip cookies. She makes, I mean, incredible desserts, but also just makes a lot of food in general. So anybody who's come to my house um, or come to visit or anything, they've normally met my parents or anyone I grew up with knew that like my house growing up was kind of like the place to, I don't want to say hang out, but kind of, of like that is a very, my parents even still, to this day, my mom is extremely welcoming, very hospitable, wants people to come over, oh, I'll make you something, that type of thing. So I had that, but I also had the benefit of like they weren't in a place of always putting 
all the emotions towards food. Like we definitely liked food as a family, but like there's a lot of people that I knew growing up that had a lot of restriction towards food. Whereas like still to this day and all growing up, we always had like a bowl of M&Ms on our counter. So like we could just go up and grab M&Ms, which it's like now there's even studies coming out of showing that being able to have like access to that food without it making like making it super special or like restricting it allows you to have a better relationship and a better like body composition with food. And so I had really positive aspects of that, but there also wasn't a lot of food education of a lot about knowing about protein and what was going in because my mom is a very southern cook so it is very (laughs) much like butter and sugar and throw it all in there type of thing so it wasn't like health conscious cooking so like that went into it but then I also had a lot of friends that were petite growing up so all of my friends were like four or five inches shorter than me so they're all like five one five two and I was like five 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 six and so I always just felt bigger so then I felt like I needed to pull back on food I got more conscious of it when I got into like high school time frame. But before that, it was just like eat whatever and it's not a big deal. Um, but then it kind of came into seeing like very petite friends. And it wasn't that I was like fat or overweight even necessarily. I just didn't have the body composition that I wanted. And I felt big next to so many petite people. And so that's something I can look at now of like you weren't actually big, but like I felt really big where it's like clothing size of like, oh, they're wearing this size and I like they're wearing zeros and double zeros and I'm in size six. And so it was something that was kind of hard to navigate as like a young girl of like, you don't understand different body types necessarily. You don't understand the fact that each inch you can add like 10 to 20 pounds of weight and that I was just in the Uh, mindset of like they weigh this much and I weigh this much or this is their clothing size and this is my clothing clothing size. So then I started to like restrict food, um, not in a super unhealthy way because my mom honestly wouldn't have let me do that because it was always (laughs) like just make sure you eat enough food. There was yeah. There still is. Like, there's always snacks at my mom's house. Um, and um, then as I got into college, that's when I started to learn about food and started to get into fitness. And then I started just counting calories until I learned about macros. Then I went way too much of, like, just if it fits your macros and eating a bunch of junk. And now I'm finally settled in the place of, like, eating foods that make me feel good, that fuel me, that are good for you. But, of course, like, I still eat other things, too. Um, and kind of finding that balance. Yeah. And I think adding in running and uh, do it, still doing some, you know, strength training and hypertrophy training that like just in general, it's actually helped me like just be more excited about food in general too. Um, you know, granted, I'm not eating as high of the pre and the post-workout meal as I used to carbohydrate wise, because, you know, when you're growing, like there were times where like it was a hundred grams for a if carbohydrates for a pre and post workout meal, and sometimes more than that, um, and intra workout carbs on top of that, yeah, that's rough. Uh, because yeah, the demand is just so high, and so um, I like it that at least for a run, one, it doesn't take me to like prepper get preparation to go to the gym. Right, you're just like thinking, okay, well, like if I want to have my pre workout meal, I got to have yes. it an hour, so it's around mm-hmm. this time, and then my post workout meal, I need to get it in as soon as possible. I need to make sure I have my intra. Like there's just so much more to it than people realize with like trying to gain weight when it is a little bit more of a challenge for you. Um, Gain weight and gain muscle tissue. Yeah. But just as a whole, like running, it's almost kind of made me like have a little bit more of like a healthier appetite too. Because I am, I'm an individual that like food, it just feels like um, more of a job. Like, oh, oh God, I got to have breakfast or I got to have my lunch or, oh, it's been, you know, three, four hours. Like it's about time for me to have my next meal, even though I'm not the most hungriest for it. And I'll say right off the bat, I'm not the best cook. I'm trying to work on my, you know, MRS degree of like being a better (laughs) wife and like, you know, trying to make sure that like I kind of have a little bit more of that nurturing aspect. But um, I think it's really helped me actually just have a little bit of a better relationship with food because I'm like, oh, like I can just get in a couple of rice cakes and half a scoop of protein right before my run. And then maybe I'll actually be hungrier after my, after my run to then have like a considerably higher um, uh, meal than I normally would. So it's been nice just to have 
you know, that nice little trade-off. Yeah. And that's even like the reason I like going on a walk in the morning. Not only is it because I wake up and I work directly in the morning. And then after I've worked for like an hour or two, then my break is going on that walk and eating breakfast. So it's multi-purpose of like why I go on that walk. Walks always help me like clear my mind, just being outside. All that helps me. But it just... I want to make sure that I'm hungry for breakfast. And that's the big thing of like, I like going on that walk. And that's even why I've increased my steps some is just to make sure that I can continue to have that appetite. Because once you get to the place that you, know, you don't have an appetite, then it's just like hard to honestly come back from. Uh, so yeah. anyway, I can get that moving forward. Uh, but Especially I in the morning. Yes, very much so in the morning. And it helps a ton for me personally. Um, and that's even how I schedule my meals of like my biggest meals in the morning, because I know that's when I'll be the most hungry because that's when I have like movement scheduled to do. And then it allows me as as the day go on, I'm normally sitting more because I'm just at my desk. And so I have smaller meals as the day goes on just to best suit my schedule and my hunger levels. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing, turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty? I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. Um, but I wanted to ask, what advice would you give yourself five years ago? Oh, man. Uh, honestly, it'd be like believe in yourself more because I have been very thankful to be in this position to work through social media in the fitness space and work with clients, right? But I and Scott and I have had so many talks like this that he's kind of had this stage in life to where he you know, had this large belief in himself and knew that he could do more and he didn't want to be in the same patterns that he was at. He he did that 10 years ago. He already had that feeling. For me, that's been the past you know, four or five years. And that's when I decided to go into the fitness space that um, it's, I, I do say uh, with like a lot of respect that getting into the indus fitness industry has came a lot easier to me than it has for other people that have known that they wanted to go into the industry, you know, like had a really large passion for it. I have thankfully been able to take uh, advantage of the opportunity because I've always loved being active. I've always loved weightlifting. I started it when I was in high school. I just never had the belief that I could do it going into adulthood of like getting into that industry. Mm -hmm. And so, He's already had that. And I found that I've had, kind of had that time in my place in my life where I'm just like, I want to improve who I am and how I view myself. Because again, just kind of like correlating back to like when I was a kid, my mom was just working so much all the time. My parents were divorced. Us kids, you know, were triplets and my older sister was in college. So like during those really like young years, we were always kind of a, not intentionally against each other, but because we were always compared to being triplets, we wanted to be our own individual selves. And so with that, like, I never really had this point in my life where somebody would just sit me down and be like, you are the smartest, the most capable, the most, you know, intelligent individual that you can do. And all you need is a little belief and a hell of a lot of effort for it. And I wish that I could have correlated the small belief that I had with me for like cross country and track uh, at those times to like how I feel about myself because it takes a lot of belief uh, to believe in yourself, to give yourself grace, to give yourself um, and not be like as hard on yourself. So like that would definitely be it. And I feel like now, um, especially like just you know, being on this podcast, I, I did a podcast, I think it was about a year and a half ago, close to when like I moved back, I feel way more at ease doing this podcast because I feel like I know myself better and I'm working on those things that I would push off a lot of the time. 
Um, and it's, it's just been so much easier to like approach things with like excitement instead of like fear or scarcity. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. And we have a lot of similarities in our life in a multitude of ways. But like Alex is someone who has had like such strong self-belief like his whole entire life. And it's something that I dealt or I was navigating with like negative self-talk and a lot of like not having belief in myself and not even knowing like it's something where he'll say of like, well, what did you want to be when you grow up or what did you dream for it's like I know this kind of sounds like sad as fuck but like I didn't have these big dreams and aspirations not like because people didn't tell me I should or anything like that it's just that I always I wasn't looking at like okay let's look so big and dream and believe it was just kind of like what is the next step like what needs to be done next okay I finish this then I do this then I do this and so it's been um, transformative to be around Alex so much over the past seven years and to have that belief wear off on me not only because he believes in me so much and I have other people who believe in me but it's just it, it truly we talk about it a lot of like what allows you to have success within what you're doing and so much of it is just self-belief because you, no one else is going to do it for you. Like, yes, other people will believe in you and will care about you and will support you. But at the end of the day, like you are the person that is going to keep it driving forward. No one can do the work for you. And the times when you're so down and it's like, I can't do this anymore. Like, that's when you have to pick yourself up by your bootstraps and say like, yes, the fuck you can. Like, you can do this. You will accomplish it. And it's been so crazy because like now it's something where even though mountains feel like so big and there's so many things even just within business business and life that like I'm still figuring out, my mindset has been like, I'm going to figure it out, period. Or like, this is going to happen. Like even with different things that have happened within PD, and it's kind of been like, this is so much, this is overwhelming. I don't know what to do. My mindset has just been like, it doesn't matter. I'm going to make it happen. Like I believe in myself and I believe in this company so much that like we're going to get to where we want to go. And it is just so true of like being able to have that self-belief is going to drive you in everything, regardless of if you're in fitness or not, just like in everything that you do, being able to believe in yourself and push yourself to show yourself how capable you are is so extremely important. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but like I was kind of the same like growing up um, that, you know, i my family was just basically in like survival mode the entire time. It wasn't this kind of like laid back thing. I was either driving four to six hours to go see my dad because we'd go see my dad and, you know, my parent, my mom's trying to work with my dad, all that stuff. But um, that was definitely something like in a similar situation it was just never instilled with me as a kid. And so it almost felt, and I don't know if anybody else like feels this way, like when they're trying to find what self-belief they can conjure up within themselves it feels uncomfortable and mm -hmm. it almost felt fake to like have this like se sense of self-belief within myself because I never knew what that felt like. Yeah. I was just like, oh, this feels weird. This feels really uncomfortable to just like kind of be nice to myself or at least just have a little bit of belief in myself. But it really is just this large practice that you have to do. And it's not that you have to do it and because fake it till you make it used to be like something in my head for a while. And I think I utilized that to my opportunity, but I've faked it so much, um, especially like before the fitness industry, just like going throughout life, life is okay. But like I would push away other things that were a challenge to me that could actually help me believe in myself. That like now that I'm kind of addressing those challenges a little bit more, it's helped me cultivate cultivate that little bit of extra belief that it's just like, no, like I got this, like the world's not ending this little bit of, you know, uncomfortableness where it feels uncomfortable, believe in myself. Like that's going to only help you have more grace for yourself. That's only going to help you like develop into the human that you want to be. So it really felt awkward for me to feel that little bit of belief. It just I was just like, oh, this feels really weird. And I don't know if you felt the same. No, I love that you mentioned that because I remember I saw this quote um, or like this thread on Twitter and it was a psychologist and she was talking about like confidence feels like arrogance if you've never been confident before. And she had a list of like a few other things of like wow. self-care feels like this when you've never done this before. And I was like, I like read it and read it so many times because I was like, that's just it. Like it's it does feel uncomfortable because yeah. you've never felt that before 
before. So you feel like it's on the other side. Like it feels like, oh, being confident in myself is being so arrogant or being so selfish or doing all this. And it's like, no, that's just confidence. You just have literally never felt it, that it feels so foreign and uncomfortable that you're doing this like insane thing and being like this steamroller person. And it's like, no, you literally are just believing in yourself. And it's hard to like realize that of it's like, oh, shit. Like, yeah, I I literally have never had this. So it does feel so foreign to me. Yeah. And I think that's um, one thing that I really liked about Scott, um, that he had such a confidence about himself because he already did a lot of that like self-development that I was avoiding for such a long time that like in the beginning of our relationship that I really, really liked about him and still do is that he has this great amount of confidence that almost kind of slightly looks a little arrogant, but it's just because he's done a lot of deep work within himself. And so, you know, he's already at this 100% level where I feel like I'm at 25% of self-belief, but it feels better to just be able to get closer and closer to having just like that, being able to be comfortable and know what it feels like to have that self-belief rather than it feel fake. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. And I'm glad that you are raising that percentage up a little bit more because you should have (laughs) belief. And even with you being on the podcast, Alex and I were talking about um, you on a walk the other day and we're just like, Savannah has has like so much going for her and is so smart and can do so much. But it is just that fact of like truly believing in yourself that you can do it. Um, Because I can tell you a lot of people see it around you. um, And just seeing it more and more for yourself. Yeah, it literally just astounds me that you guys even utter talking about (laughs) me in any degree. (laughs) Because I just think so highly of you guys. I feel like so thankful, even though we're the same age, I feel like you guys are just above and beyond of what you guys give your business, your clients, your self-development, like everything. And it helps me like connect that you have gone through very similar struggles as I have. Because if I didn't know you, I don't know why my camera's doing that. (laughs) Mine Um, does the same thing. If you do two thumbs up, it'll give you a cool reaction. (laughs) You got to hold it there for a second. It does like fireworks, I think, for the two thumbs up. (laughs) No, it does not. Yeah. I'm gonna have to try that. And I, if you it do does that this, thumb- it'll do like a, a like a rock show behind you. Oh my god, that's hilarious! It's for like iOS devices. I found it out the hard way, and then my brother showed me all the hand signals that you can do. Oh, so it's not Loom that does it? Because whenever I do Loom video, no, it's your Apple. It's all of your Apple stuff, and since you're on a Mac, then it pushes over. <gasps> so it pushes to my Loom and my Zoom, um, oh, and so anything smart, that's Sue. on a Mac. Oh, well, it's my brother. He's like a computer <laughs> genius, and so I was like, why is this? happening. It keeps happening during meetings and I don't know what to do. And then he explained it to me. Okay, cool. Well, we learned everything new. I thought it was just Loom when I was replying to client videos. And I was just like, I hope you're getting a hoot out of like this bubble thumbs up that's happening right next to me. Oh, I'll I'll show you all the hand signals. You can do some cool stuff. (laughs) Do the rock on and the fireworks. Man, Uh I even forgot what we were talking about, but that's hilarious. I'm glad I learned that. Uh, We were talking about um, belief in yourself and uh, you look up to Alex and I, and you couldn't believe that we were talking about you. Yeah, because I I really just uh, think that you guys complement each other so well, so well. And so to know that you guys are like, at least you are kind of going through like similar struggles that I am, it helps me recognize that like the challenges that Scott and I go through with working together and being business partners, it's so relieving to have a couple that goes through the same thing, um, you know, just at different levels. Um, And just to know that like, I'm not the only one that's working with my significant other 24 seven, because at least for me personally, it adds another challenge on top of, um, Like how I just like wind down from the day and just like chill out because I'm that person to where like once work is done, like I want work to be done. Like I want to clock out just like I used to, but I know and we know that like there's times that like we do have to work and stuff like that. But I don't know about you, but at least like Scott or like at least Alex, if Alex is at all the same, like they love talking about work all the time. Mm -hmm. Like the only time that they're not talking about work or not talking about, hey, I've been thinking about doing this and been thinking about doing this. That takes so much brain power for me to think about something on top of all the other things that I'm trying to do that it just, it feels a little challenging, but it's so exciting for for him that 
it, it's just good to know that, you know, you guys might be a similar dynamic or again, like just those personal beliefs that you're working on too. Yeah. Well, first you can always text or call me and we can chat about stuff because it is hard going through it. Um, and it's even harder going through it alone. But the other thing, and I'll say specifically on that, cause I was going to bring up of like working with a significant other. Cause I think actually the next podcast episode that Alex and I record might be about that. Cause some people were asking, um, about like how we navigate with that. And I will tell you for that situation specifically, what we have like instilled in our relationship is that you are allowed to say, I don't want to talk about work right now because it does feel like there is kind of like this never ending of it's like you're always on the clock because it's your business and there's all that going on. But we realized that being always on the clock first, it was taking away from our actual romantic relationship because it was just always about work. And then it was also taking away from just our personal life and our ability to wind down because then it was like in all of our free time, we're talking about work. And so there was a situation where like I was making breakfast. And like I said, I work in the morning. I wake up early. I work for like two hours. And then I take like an hour break to go on a walk and make and eat breakfast. And I was making breakfast. And I normally like watch Top Chef or The Bachelorette or like something like silly during that time. And I'm like not thinking about work at all. And he's come into the kitchen and like asked me a question about work. And I would get like really flustered, then he would get frustrated, and it would just cause like this dynamic that didn't need to be there. And so it's something that we will either say of either I'm talking to you as your business partner, or I'm talking to you as your wife type of thing to like clarify what we're talking about. Because again, lines can get blurred, even if it's like, okay, we're talking about different things. But then it's also the aspect that we're allowed to say, like, I, I don't want to talk about work right now. Or I told him in that instance, it was like, I'm not in the headspace for work right now. Once I get back to my desk, I can talk about that. Because it was something that I felt like I needed my spreadsheets in front of me. I needed to look at more data to have the conversation where he was just wanting to have the conversation then. So the other day, we went over to my mom's to use her pool, and it was just us there. And we just were floating around talking about other stuff. And we ended up on the conversation of work, but both of us were fine to have the type of conversation that we were having. But then there's been other times when we're winding down in the evening, and and I'll say like, oh, I had a client and he'll say, I, I really don't want to talk about work right now. And he'll like even just interrupt me and not let me finish and just say like, I'm not in the headspace to talk about work. And sometimes I'll even fight of like, oh, this isn't about work. I'm just like telling a story about my client. And he's like, I, I just don't want to talk about it, period. It's still work. <laughs> and we've been able to get to the point of like, we don't take it personally. It's not like this frustration. It's just, okay, this isn't the right time and place to talk about this. But it's like sometimes in the evening, we do end up talking about work and we're fine with it. But sometimes it's just having that comment to say like, hey, I, I am not wanting to talk about work right now. And it's just the mutual agreement that we're not going to take it personally. And that that's okay that that person is like saying the boundary that they have or just where their headspace is at, because that's only going to allow us to connect better either when we're at work or when we're not at work to be able to have those conversations. So it's something that it's not like we're like after 6 p.m. no talk about work because I don't feel like that's realistic for us. And that doesn't work for us personally. That might work for another couple, but it doesn't work for us. But for us, just just being able to say like it's a hard and fast rule that if one of us starts talking about work and we're not at work, like we're not in a meeting type of thing, like for in a meeting, he can't just be like, I don't want to talk about work right now. I'll be like tough nuggies. We're talking about it. Um, but if we're nuggies. doing something out, yes, <laughs> but if we're doing something else, we both have the ability and it's both an understanding that it can be like, I don't want to talk about work right now. And that has helped us so much. And it's what I tell anyone that I have talked to about working with their significant other is like, there needs to be boundaries because there are times for both of us of like, he's really excited to talk about something or I'm really excited to talk about something, but it's not fair to always just bring it up when it's convenient for you. Cause that's even something of like, there was, um, something came up and it was either something with billing or something we needed to talk about, but it was like, I wanted to talk about it right then because it was on my mind and I like had just gone through stuff with it. And, but then I was like, okay, he's in a different headspace. He's going out to train. He's had a hard day. These different things are going on. This isn't the right time to talk about it. I'm going to make a note of it and we'll talk about it because we had like a meeting the next day. I was like, we'll talk about it then. Um, and that's what I had to get better at because I would just talk about something as soon as it came into my mind where we both need to work on um, and have worked on the aspect of like, there's a time and place for that. And that's not always a hard and fast time and place. Like it's only in meetings or it's only here, but we both need 
need to be able to vocalize what that looks like for each other. Because again, that's going to help our own mental health. That's going to help our personal relationship and our professional relationship just to be able to know, like, you can say that there's no hard feelings. We move on and then we go to whatever the next conversation is. Yeah. And I think you touched on something that was really um, important. And again, I love this man so much. He just has made me like develop into such a better woman as a whole that I never thought I could be. And in, in the best way possible, it's challenging because it does get really frustrating. But like you touched on something that like I've been trying to improve on better in my relationship and relationship with friends too, is trying to like think about the big picture of their day rather than your your day. Like you said, mm-hmm. he's had a hard work day. He was a little bit stressed out like this. He's mentally getting ready to train because we all know like we've been in those days where it's like mentally, you know, either I'm excited about this training session and nothing's going to stop me or it's been a hard day and I'm trying to get into this training mindset. So if my wife says something to me and says, hey, we need to do this right now. It's important. You're going to be like, oh my God, I was just, I was just trying to do this. And then now it's ruining, you know, like me doing my own things as a human being, because I don't know about you, but like whenever Scott like skips a training session, just like when I skip a training session and we know that like we are not in the best place to like, you know, train or like just, um, be able to tackle stuff whenever you start to see them like slip up on the things that help them as an individual like training Mm -hmm. like nutrition staying on top of other things that like you want that more for them and i have to be more aware of when my thoughts just because i'm saying something that i think is on my mind at the moment i don't have to say it right then and there Mm-hmm. Because I think that's one thing I never, um, I never learned when I was younger. If I wanted something, I just always like I vocalized it. I was quite stubborn and quite vain as a little kid, and so like I, I, I lack the idea of um, just a little bit of empathy with somebody else's situation. And he's been able to teach me a lot of that with like recognizing that like, hey, like the world doesn't revolve around you. And I, you know, like that used to be me as a little kid. I was, you know, the youngest sibling syndrome basically. Um, um, it, is that he's helped me like recognize that like you need to always look at your your spouse's uh, perspective um, of like how has their day been? Is it appropriate to bring this up? And can you like put a pen in it? Is it you know a do or die situation? And usually it's something that you can be like, hey, I'll mention it to them later, or I'll just put it on my to do list in the morning. So listening and having that bigger picture of what his day has been like has really helped me. And I can't say enough about having a shared Google Calendar for people, even if you don't work together, like knowing what the other person's schedule is, just so it's like you mm. don't have to ask. And you're just able to look like I was able to look and be like, okay, he's going to be training and doing this. um, And I'm going to be doing this. So like, I can either make decisions for myself of like, I'm going to go ahead and eat because I know he's busy, I don't need to wait for him, or I'm going to go do this thing. It just helps so much because then it also gives me an idea of what his day is like. So going into the evening, it can be like, okay, he's literally been in meetings all day, he likely doesn't want to talk more about random shit. It's like, let's go ahead and shift the conversation in a different direction. That's a good idea. We'll have to share um uh things because he needs to know when I'm doing client check-ins, when mm-hmm. I, when I'm doing new client programming, when I'm studying, yes. when he's got business calls to do, and when I need to be in that with it. So I'm definitely gonna take a, a note from that. That'll be huge. And another thing that I would recommend is that Alex does struggle with meetings sometimes where like I within the role that I have within the company sometimes have to sit down and I'm in meetings for like three to five hours straight. And like, yes, sometimes that can be difficult of like, I want to get up and move, but I can like focus and be like, let's go down all of these things and let's knock it out. And so then we found that we would try to have like these longer meetings to go through stuff and have them less frequently. And then it would just be very distracting. And we would find ourselves being like, well, we're on a good place. So like, let's just skip that meeting and get done the other stuff we need to get done. So now we switch to, we have like a 30 minute meeting every Friday, like during the work day. It's like right after another meeting that we have and we just touch base on things and it just helps that it's 30 minutes it's quick we don't have to like it's not this big project that we have to do because sometimes like hour plus long meetings can be overwhelming and daunting yes and so it's nice that it's just like let's touch base on a few things make sure that we're all good to go because that's what would come up is it would be like well I have this thing I want to talk to you about but it doesn't feel like there's a good time to talk to you about it so then it's just kind of like sitting in my head or on my to-do list that I need to talk to you and then whether 
would be like resentment or frustration or whatever feeling would be coming up. And it's like, this didn't need to happen. We just needed to make time to be able to go through stuff. Um, And so it helps if it's just kind of like a touch point of like, are we on the same page? Did you have something you wanted to bring up? Um, And we'll like share the agenda. So then we can kind of add to it throughout the week of like, oh, we need to touch on that here. Or we need to talk about that here. Um, That has been super duper helpful for us. Yeah, I'll take notes of that. It'll help big time. Yes. <laughs> we can chat more about it as well. Um, but I want to wrap things up here um, and talk about what are your gym girl must-haves. Like if you were to say someone going into the gym or just a fitness girly, what would be like your personal must-haves? Um, a big enough backpack or mild enough like duffel bag, nothing big like you're going on, you know, a luggage trip or anything (laughs) like that. But I got this bag from Dagny Dover. It's their backpack, a little pricey, but it lasts a really long time. I had their fanny packs and a cross sling bag from them. Definitely a bag to where like you can like fit a little bit more things in than you think. I think number one, and I see this all the time, I did a post on it a while back, use some kind of flat soled shoes. The New Balances are so damn cute and the Nike from Marrows and like wearing Asics or Hoka's to train. But if you're doing any kind of strength training, please do your limbs, your balance, your stability a favor, and just muscle recruitment a favor in general if you want to put on more muscle tissue, wear some flat soled shoes. I am a big proponent. I just got some Metcons a few months back. I absolutely love them because they work with a lot of different activities um, and they look cool. Yeah. And I will put a little asterisk, flat t- flat shoes, but also if you can get a bigger toe box, because that's a big yeah. thing of being able for that muscle recruitment she mentioned of being able to have your toes spread out is going to do huge. And if you constantly are cramming your toes together, I promise you, you are having issues all the way up the line of like knee, hip issues, issues recruiting certain muscles, like any way that you can have a wider shoe because I know Converse are normally like the go-to when people say flat shoe but like I feel like I am absolutely shoving my foot into a Converse um, so I really like the Vivo is a brand that we um, use they're, they're like labeled as barefoot shoes um, but I love them for training and they like just stay in the gym and it's like I always know that they're in there and I'll just change into them when I need them. Yeah and God, I probably have like way more than three things. But the other thing I can think about is, especially for women, we're always looking to like develop our lower half, right? Um, We want to be able to make sure that we can, you know, try to take advantage of it as much as possible for some people that are in training like three days a week. So get your own ankle attachments and make sure that they're at least padded because you can get those tiny little ankle attachments that are like the cheapest pair. Fine, do it. That's going to be okay. You're not going to have to worry about your gym's equipment or if somebody else has them. But if you have your own ankle ankle straps, they're your own attachment to it that you can just put in your bag because they take up a very small amount very, of space. Yes. That That's really great to do. Or basically like any gym attachment that you can think about, of course, that's not like handles or anything like that, but ankle attachments, I would even say um, barbell clips of mm-hmm. your own so you don't have to worry about the gyms, um, lifting straps, 1,000%. Oh, yes. I tell so many love, of my clients, if you love, can love. get a pair yeah, of lifting straps, you are not going to be limited by your grip. Now, grip strength is great. Cool. If you want to do grip strength, great. But I tell my clients, I'm not the one to like look at for grip strength because and I'm just looking to get strong. Just realistically, like you are not going to be able to match your grip strength to what your back yeah. or your leg strength is. Like, let's yeah. really look at how big the back muscles are and how big the like leg muscles are and you're Massive. wanting to be like hey for my RDL I should just be able to grip these 80 pound dumbbells <laughs> and be able to do that and it's like no I I literally use versa grips all the time I'm like I'll use yeah. the grips. I'm good. I'm more worried about my lower body development than my grip strength. Absolutely. So like, yeah, lifting straps, your own grips for the barbell, all those things that I lift that, that I listed. But also a trick that I like to do in case you use stuff like um, uh, heel wedges because it helps me with my squats or if I want to make something a little bit more quad biased. Um, I just keep some stuff in like a Tupperware looking thing in the back of my Jeep in my trunk. Because if you have like lifting shoes that you just don't like to wear otherwise and you only use them at the gym, you're going to use your car to get to the gym. So why not just make this like little tiny storage section of resistance bands, your hooks or not your hooks, but your lifting straps, the um, the barbell clips, like anything that you know that you're going to need at the gym that you don't want to have to rely on the gym for, just pop into your gym bag or just go over to your car real quick and be like, oh yeah, it's in my car. 
Yeah, and you're just perfect. so much more self sufficient. You have everything you need, and you just feel more like you know, like an athlete. Like you got your stuff together. Like you're prepared. Yes, I, especially having the stuff in the car. That's a great point because it's like the heel wedges are heavy if you're carrying those around in your backpack or your gym bag all the time. But if it's like, oh, I'm only using them on this one day, then definitely just throw them in your car and then be able to take them out of your car so you don't even have to worry about it. Yeah, there's this little square Velcro. It's actually two sections of two squares put together um, to where it can attach to the back of your seat because it's got like that fuzzy material on it. So it sticks to it so it doesn't rock around in my um, in my trunk. I love it. Well, that's perfect. I'll have to get the link from you so that we can <laughs> share it um, for sure. <laughs> but uh, is there anything that um, where people can find you? I'll have like your information down in the show notes. Um, but just if you want to tell people where they can find you and we'll have all of it linked below. Yeah, absolutely. I'm primarily on Instagram. I have always thought about YouTube. So that's not something that's completely off the table, but something that I've thought about in the future. But I am primarily on Instagram. I am on TikTok as well. Um, and then uh, Facebook too is where I just try to be on all the major platforms. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining Savannah. We'll definitely talk more between the two of us. And then I'd love to have you back on the podcast because uh, I've been telling people, I'm like, I just have really loved doing this with my friends so I can just have little chit chats and uh, we're all very busy people. So it's nice to be able to like cut out the time and, you know, kind of multitask of like getting a podcast out there and catching up. Uh, so we'd love to have you back on the podcast. And thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. We'll be in touch.